A little background, um, most of you have, who have come before know this, but each semester the School of Architecture convenes a panel to discuss themes about what defines leadership and how ethics and values shape the ways in which we use the skills of architectural education and our profession to affect positive change. And we see this at the root of our academic programs and hope that our students uh, are inspired in their own careers to take on the promise and challenges of our profession to improve all environments, built and natural. So, uh, you've got that, that's your mission, okay? Uh, tonight, we are discussing the opportunities in design to support, promote, and empower social justice. Our speakers, Deanna Van Buren and Kyle Rollins, and their office, Designing Justice and Designing Spaces, partner with nonprofit and community entities to uncover innovative solutions, like the Five Keys mobile classroom, which I just saw on one of my project sites on Tuesday. More about that later. Um, the Oakland Restorative Justice Center and the Pop-Up Resource Village to meet the uh, needs of underserved communities. So the questions that we'll be posing tonight are assembled in conjunction with our fifth year Bachelor of Architecture students who are currently taking the professional practice class. Um, and we have some really good questions. And so I thank you all for your participation in that. Um, and most of all, we're really excited to have both of you here uh, tonight to share your insights and experiences. So we're gonna start the event by inviting, I was gonna say each of them, but they're actually gonna present together. <gasps> That's a change for us. Um, and to have them talk about their career path, um, work today, visions for the future, all that good stuff. Um, and then we're gonna ask all of our pertinent questions. I have like too many, I think, but we'll, we'll figure it out. And then we'll open up the discussion to the floor and any questions that everybody else has, okay? So um, I wanna just briefly introduce both of our speakers. They're gonna you know, go into more depth, but um, Deanna here to my left is the co-founder and design director of DJDS. And prior to starting that, she spent 15 years as a design lead on domestic institutional and higher education projects in the Bay Area, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Her design leadership in restorative justice design has attracted funding such as the Burn Justice Innovative Innovation Grant, sorry, with the Center for Court Innovation to develop a peacemaking center in Syracuse, New York. Sounds really, really exciting and interesting and I want to hear more about that. Um, her co-founder, partner Kyle Rollins, co-founder of DJDS, and he's responsible for its development activities. Kyle's been active in the analysis, financing, design, construction, and management of real estate in North and South America for nearly 15 years. And that's really, I think, a great duo, you know, to get this to work. You've got the design and you've also got someone who really understands how that all comes together with financing and land use and all those, all those things are, that have to happen, right? So in addition to pursuing development projects in New York City, Kyle has consulted uh, to the New York City Housing Authority in the development of a solution for how that agency as landlords with a mission to help residents grow their income and assets could spearhead the creation of economic development uh, to empower them um, and also help them build sustainable uh, producing uh, businesses. So that's exciting. We really want to hear more about that. So without further ado, uh, if you would please give us your history and... <laughs> Hello? Okay, there we go. That works. Um, hey, good evening. Thank you for having us. This is really exciting. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we'd like to start by just telling you a little bit about our career, how we kind of got here, the sort of context that lays the stage, and the reality of trying to jump off and do something like this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our mission, you know, what, what, we're, what we're, the problem we're trying to solve, and then some solutions that we'd like to present, and there are many, many more, so we'll just show a few of them. Uh, so let's get started. Who's first? It's me. This is me uh, at architecture school. I went to school at the University of Virginia with Kyle. That's where we met in the <clears throat> 90s. 
And it was uh, a time where we were doing something called party-driven design. Does anyone know what party-driven design is? Do you guys even use that word anymore? Do you? Okay, just check in. Right, this very formal diagram of a building. It was very clear, and we were doing we were doing like houses for a concert pianist and right. a tomb for and Andre family. Tarkovsky. Like <laughs> ridiculous. So anyway, whatever. That's what we were doing. And Kyle, you didn't you knew you didn't want to do this anyway. So yeah, true enough. <laughs> um, I'll come later. Yeah, and so I, we went our separate ways, Kyle and I. Um, he went on to real estate development, but I really did want to be an architect, and so I went to Columbia University, and this is what we were doing. So we went, I went from party-driven design to making blobs, and I didn't want to make blobs. I went to the dean. It's like Dean Shumi, Bernard Shumi was the dean at that time, and I said, well, look, why are we making blobs? Why are we building cities in China? I have never been to China, but we live right near Harlem, and there's some folks there that could, maybe we could be working with. Um, what do you think of that? And he told me I was at the wrong school and maybe I should transfer. So I stayed because I was like, well, if Bernard Schumi thinks that's not a good idea, it must not be. Uh, and I, I put my um, activist, early activist desires to rest. Uh, I then left for Europe and went overseas and started to design and build shopping malls, lots of shopping centers. Uh, this is in England. Uh, I was worked in the Middle East for quite a while, doing large shopping centers there in Dubai. Uh, ended up doing stuff in China, cities in China. I guess Bernard was right. Um, <laughs> and at uh, that time, we were working with huge developers. I was primarily working with developers as a design lead. And while I did not want to be doing shopping centers, what was happening was I was, for the first time, starting to look at both culture and place for the first time. You know, how does the culture of a people and a place really manifest itself in the physical environment? So for me, in that way, it was, it was exciting. Uh, but when I got back to the States, it was kind of more of the same. I came back to the Bay, doing lots of uh, uh, real big real estate developers. And really, I was always only in the room with the wealthy and the powerful. No one ever looked like me. I was never doing projects for anybody like me. And after a while, I was really starting to get to a point where like, well, what is the purpose of this work? Why am I doing this? Who is this for? I had questions about the ethics of some of the projects that we were doing, particularly some of the projects overseas, job sites with people working 24 hours a day and inadequate housing. And it was a part of a, our, our industry that was really um, distasteful. So I started to ask a couple questions. But I'm going to let Kyle talk about his parallel journey and the big question we asked together, but go for it. So with these Wall Street photos, I was actually thinking about um, the years just after undergraduate school. So this is mid-90s, set the stage. We're in lower Manhattan. Deanna's doing an architectural internship. I'm working for Solomon Brothers. They're a mergers and acquisitions group. We'd meet for lunch. I was so tired working 80 hours a week doing this investment banking business. But it was a great training because I knew even while at architecture school that I probably wasn't going to be an architect but wanted to be a real estate developer. But yet architecture and urban planning would be a great sort of background information that I probably wouldn't be able to find elsewhere at the undergraduate level. But then following undergraduate school, I figured, okay, let me learn a little bit about money and why not try it at Wall Street? So I convinced them that if they took engineers to do entry-level Wall Street jobs, maybe they would take an architecture student too. So they bought it. It's a good experience. Um, but then my career sort of quickly moved towards real estate. So after business school, um, I was very interested in doing affordable housing. I had no idea that it would probably take me to Latin America first. So these are... Uh, a couple of diagrams of some projects that I worked on while in Brazil. We uh, started an affordable housing developer to begin to address the large housing shortage in Brazil. They have some six million units of deficit that they need, and we built 4,000 units while I was there. Uh, here's a residential project. That's and the question part. Right. So <laughs> how and why did we get uh, involved with social uh, justice and its intersection with architecture? 
Well, it was kind of like that, right? <laughs> it was more also like a, a stopover before that of why am I doing this and how do I get to a position where I can just do what I want to do? So Kyle and I both quit our jobs so, sort of at the same time. And we kind of show this picture because this is what it really feels like <laughs> when you quit your job and you have no working capital and no savings. I think I had like $500 in savings or something. I don't recommend that. Don't do that. But that's what we did. Um, and we started in a couple ways. Just as like, this is the reality of it, just so you kind of get the trajectory, um, is that I started doing design build work uh, and little, little gallery installations and little things along the way. Uh, well, I did this in another thing, I'll tell you, but uh, we did the Global Lives premiere at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts with filmmakers who were uh, filming the day in the life of people. So it's kind of getting closer to my love of, of doing this more socially engaged work. Uh, also did a, at the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery, we were working with youth poets uh, to create a place of like, what is poetry like? How do you write poetry? What is the experience of poetry? So that was a, a National Endowment for the Arts grant, so early grant writing life. Um, and then I also, um, to be honest, had a pretty soft landing, and then I started working on a video game called The Witness. Does anyone play video games here? Has anyone heard about this game? Yeah, it came out uh, last year by a, a developer named Jonathan Blow. Um, and so I was the lead architect for this, so you got like 40 buildings, you know, and, and all these environments, and I spent five years actually working on it, but what it, did, it allowed me to do was really quit my job with some kind of income uh, that would support it, and it's a little bit like Miss, so it was a kind of a world that you would go to and, and you would play puzzles. So it was very peaceful, it was not misogynistic, it was not violent, but in a way it sort of supported some of the work um, Kyle and I do now, both uh, financially, but also conceptually. Like, how do you build new worlds? Like, how do you build something from nothing when there is nothing? There's no site. There's no building codes. Uh, it's something, a space that no one has ever been in or, or, or seen of or heard before. Ah, Convent <laughs> Avenue. So about the same time, I had left my corporate gig. I had done some housing. And now I had found my first potential development. It's this building right here. And the owners had basically had a brilliant career in real estate. So this is in Upper Manhattan. They went on to buy like 100 buildings, and they had this little small building on the side that they said, hey, listen, you know, if you want it, 10% deposit, non-refundable. I knew it was a great deal, but I had, you know, no more, you know, income. I'd quit my job, and I remember sitting there writing the check for the down payment, $90,000, my hand was shaking. I thought, oh my God, you know, this money's never coming back. I either get the building and do the project or, or I'm in big trouble. Uh, it turned out okay. Uh, some of the interior shots, the left side is where it was before, the right side, some of the work we did, still have the property. Kyle doesn't tell you, he kind of did some of that work himself. <laughs> <laughs> I was the lowest skilled, uh, <laughs> <laughs> person on labor. the job skill labor. So I was in charge of demo. So the guys <laughs> like put the stuff in the truck. I took it to the dump and I was on the side throwing it out the back of this van that I bought for $400 from a high school friend. You know, with this huge, you know, caterpillar truck on top of a heap, you know, above me thinking if this thing slipped down this 30 foot hill of debris, I was for sure gone. Um, but then shortly thereafter, started um, developing on a slightly larger scale. So this is not too far from Central Park in Manhattan. It was a ground up construction, poured in place concrete with a curtain wall, a cantilever, we went bananas, hit the recession right in the middle, lost all kinds of money, friendships, et cetera. But it was a great experience um, in terms of what I was able to learn about development and, and even the guts to kind of stay with the business even when you do hit economic downturns. Uh, a rendering from the upper floor. Okay, so this is the shocking no transition slide. So we're going into this. <laughs> so over the years that I had been trying to get my, find my own way and get to uh, doing something that was meaningful, uh, I had um, become aware of uh, the intensity of a problem we have in the United States, which is mass incarceration. Uh, I had been very interested in the role that architects could potentially play in this system, 
but really spent some time trying to understand what was happening at a much deeper level. Uh, most of you probably know that we incarcerate more of our citizens than any country in the world. We have about seven million people under carceral control, so that's probation, uh, parole, or in jail or prison. Um, and we are far beyond everyone else. So we have 2.3 million people currently incarcerated. And you know what you may or may not know is that a, a vastly disproportionate amount are, are men and women of color. The fastest growing uh, population that's being incarcerated are black women. And what has happened is we have multi-generational levels of incarceration that are destroying entire families and they're destroying entire communities. Uh, majority are in for nonviolent offenses. Uh, most of them will come home, about 95% will come home. Most have been victims of severe, uh, my sister told me not to use victims, I should use survivors of uh, severe physical and emotional abuse. Uh, so that is what the con state of, condition is of many communities of color in the United States. Um, and so how are architects participating in it? Well, we are building the infrastructure. We are participating in the building of the infrastructure for this system. And I include everything in that, right? So prisons, jails, courthouses, detention centers, police stations, all of the justice infrastructure that we know, um, all of it leads to the same thing. And I could see that the architecture was representative of that system. So what we believe we build, right? whatever the value is of a system, you literally concretize it. And so you can really see that in both the courthouse and the way that it's the hierarchical, it's location in the city, uh, the courtroom with the judge on the dais and people in sort of compartments, uh, the sort of adversarial nature of it. It's all plays out in physical, in physical space. And then prisons and jails, of course, primarily focused on security, I would say is their top priority, and then punishment. Right, so if that's the attitude, then that's what you are, what you create. And for me, frankly, I could not find a way forward in the system to practice as an architect. So I was like, I don't want to build prettier prisons and jails. You know, I don't want anything to do with that. But like, what kind of role do you play when you have a system that is structurally racist, that is broken, and in its inception is really ineffective? Right. So what do you do? You know, what is your job? How do you interface with that? Uh, and so for me, uh, it was um, a pretty, it was a moment where I was literally almost in tears because I heard about this other system. You know, I heard about restorative justice. Does anyone know what restorative justice is? Has anyone heard about it? Okay, well good, it's my pleasure to share it with you. Um, so restorative justice uh, is an alternative system and a philosophy that says when a harm has been done, when a crime has been committed, it is a breach of relationship. It is not a crime against the state. And the top priority is to meet the needs and, and the well-being, address the well-being of those who've been harmed, well, however many of them there are. And that the person who's done the harm has an obligation to make amends. They are accountable for what they did and that their actions they must take to repair the harm. These are very old practices. They're not new. You know, these are mainly reignited indigenous practices that are emerging all over the United States and all over the world where the parties come together in dialogue to create a plan to address the conduct and then that person who's committed harm carries it out so they can return to their community unstigmatized. So these are Truth and Reconciliation Courts of South Africa, if you've heard of those, the TRC after apartheid. The Gachacha Courts in Rwanda are another example of those. Victim Offender Mediation, uh, Native American and First Nations Peoples uh, Peacemaking Practices, Family Group Conferences. There are a ton of them, and they're being used in everything from addressing Capital One murder, mass social conflict, and to like fighting in schools. So it's quite range. So that was my inspiration. Kyle had a slightly different one. So just as the recession was sort of wrapping up and I was thinking, okay, I gotta get back on my feet, what to do, an opportunity came about to work with the New York City Housing Authority. I don't know if you all are familiar with the New York City Housing Authority, but it is enormous. They have 27,000 employees and 700,000 residents. One in every 12 New Yorkers lives in public housing. The average savings per family in public housing is $425. Uh, 
it costs $120 to take this subway for a month. So we are talking about extremely low-income individuals and families. So the New York City Housing Authority thought, okay, well, how can we create an, a, a program where we can support resident-owned businesses such that they might be able to uh, develop and create entrepreneurial opportunities for themselves? Um, it really started to change my focus because the idea was to do an equity fund. And I'm like, I know about equity. I was on Wall Street. I know about investments. How can we start to use these private sector techniques to do uh, social impact? Uh, and what better way than at the New York City Housing Authority with a population that was equivalent to the size of Boston? So um, one of the things that I started to realize as I stepped out to do, oh, I'm going to be a designer, I'm going to design these new spaces for restorative justice, uh, for peacemaking, was that uh, how do we pay for that, right? Most of our public architecture is paid for by your tax dollars. Um, people send out requests for proposals. You know, developers do a lot of that work. So how do you pay for new infrastructure um, that addresses the root causes of mass incarceration? And so I called Kyle. Um, God, was it 2015? Oh, maybe it was earlier. 2015, maybe earlier. I called Kyle and I was like, you know, Kyle, we have to find a way to pay for these buildings. Hmm. And I know you can figure that out. <laughs> and so we started a new company called Designing Justice, Designing Spaces. You want to say our mission because you do it so well? Yeah. We are at the uh, intersection of the built environment and restorative justice and restorative economics. You know, as real estate developers and architects, we're using our innovations to create uh, sustainable change and to really to create new models that hopefully others can copy and do in their own communities. We think that the root causes of mass incarceration is really what we're trying to address. Those root causes we think are poverty, lack of education, um, the criminal justice system itself. So all of the work that we're doing are various interventions and models, prototypes within each of those verticals. Cool. And you know, the, the people that we serve, I think we've got them into heroes, builders, and something else, but you know, we- <laughs> public, service. public servants. that's right. So we are uh, generally serving <coughs> Some city government agencies, like we will be starting a project with the San Francisco Sheriff's Department. Uh, we also work with a lot of high-performing nonprofits around the country, and then grassroots communities and people themselves. So those are our clients, and those are who we who we work for and with. You want how me to do how we do, we do it? it? Yeah, why don't you do it? Oh, you got to have jumble with Concept Development Fund, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll get it. So you know, we believe that the way that you build these new models is not in isolation as a hero, as a Howard Rourke hero. Uh, you really, really have to engage the communities that you're serving in the process. It is not very easy to do, um, but it is incredibly powerful, and it actually ensures that your project will be successful. There is no guarantee if you're not involving people who are going to use it and who have ownership of it in the design of it, in inception of it itself, uh, it will most likely fail. And so we do a lot of community workshops, uh, surveys, observations. Um, workshops are customized based on the project, and it's, it's a heavy lift, and it's a big, big part of our practice. Uh, we also develop tools to do that. So we have everything from car playing cards and decks of cards uh, to Kyle made a budget game. So, you know, like all these games we play and things that we do to help people to uh, provide input and to understand what, what's going to be happening if they wanted to. Yeah, so uh, this year we are initiated something called the Concept Development Fund, which we think is really our core competency, which is if you take our core types of clients, they have good ideas and some sort of space need, but then we're pretty far from then being able to really call that a fully developed concept such that you could take to a commercial construction lender or to your board of directors to raise money around it. So a lot of the tools and processes and the community engagement that Deanna was talking about is now finding a, a place in this concept development fund that we will then be able to use to onboard all of these clients and hopefully get more projects done and into construction. So uh, one of the tools that we've developed to get this input is called the Designing Justice Designing Spaces Toolkit. 
This is a toolkit for exploring the intersection of restorative justice and design in high security settings. And we've been running these workshops all over the country in prisons and jails with incarcerated men and women to figure out what should we build? What do they need to never get there in the first place? What kind of environments and spaces do they need to never return? Um, and it has been, frankly, for me, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. The people that I have met inside of institutions are some of the most incredible people that I have ever met. Uh, their resiliency and fortitude to heal and recover uh, within the confines and in the conditions of prisons and jails is incredible. Um, and they're some of the most human people I know, actually. And it was um, a revelation to me in some ways at the depth and the profound um, emotional maturity of many of the people I'm working with. And we really just teach them the same tools that we use. Uh, we can't bring in, you know, uh, knives and glue guns and all the junk that we use in here. So it's just a series of papers that you can fold and rip. I urge you to go to, we have another website for the toolkit called www.designingjustice.com. And you can see all the tools there. It's open source for anyone to use. And we use not just um, architectural tools and models, but we also teach them soft skills. Uh, the soft skills are how to work in teams, you know, how to present your work to others. Uh, those kinds of things, how to do an interview, right? I never learned how to do an interview when I was school, but they interview correction officers, they interview their families, and they're able to come back and also gain input. Um, the wonderful news is that earlier this year, uh, our, some of our students' work from uh, San Quentin was on display at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City as part of their Design for America exhibit. It should be coming here. Uh, we're very proud to have their work on display. Uh, they were happy to have their work on display, but to help people understand the kinds of environments and the places that they're creating. Uh, they're amazing, you know, museums and reentry centers and, and not coming from me at all. <laughs> you want to talk about Adovo? Yeah, sure. So Adovo is uh, a group that specializes in providing tablet-based software in high security environments. So these are just imagine your iPad in a jail or prison, and they're able to load up these iPads, not connected to the internet, but freestanding to then you know, do all kinds of educational programs. So one of the projects that we're working on is what Deanna mentioned, which is the toolkit to take that analog model and put it in a digital format so that it can fit onto one of these tablets with much more scalability than, than what we can do, you know, in physical form with us going into prison, which is very difficult, takes the whole day, but then to be able to distribute this nationally. And you know, one thing that we just, I forgot to add, that has been really interesting, that I think is something designers should be aware of. When we were doing this work inside of institutions, we've been asking some pretty tough questions with our students about what kind of environment would you need to face the worst thing that you've ever done? What kind of environment would you need to face someone who had harmed you deeply? What kind of environments do you need to heal from trauma? And through the visualization of these spaces, our students were were accessing trauma. So we had a lot of folks in our studios breaking down in tears as they started to uh, process trauma around self-hatred and shame and the harm that they'd done to their families. And it was a really early lesson for us around making sure that if you're going to be working in traumatized communities that you yourself are able to hold space for that kind of stuff. It's, a, it's irresponsible to go into context unaware of what you are triggering or doing or imposing upon. And I did end up having to get some training to do that. I, I got trained as a circle keeper. I had to do my own work so that I could, you know, be able to do that. Um, so just something to be aware of that was a, a pretty intense learning experience that design is actually a form of uh, trauma healing, which is an interesting thing to know just, just the process. We have art therapy. Well, design therapy works almost the same way and maybe is equally as powerful. You know, I was just thinking that the, the toolkit in Adovo, in a way, has a little bit of designing justice, is restorative justice, mm -hmm. which Deanna was talking about, and also the restorative economics. A lot of the folks who have been using the toolkit have mm -hmm. had some experience in the construction trades while outside of prison. So being able to learn about spatial reasoning uh, could very well be very helpful as they leave prison at some point to then be able to get jobs or find some type of employment in the construction trades or maybe even design. Thanks, I forgot about that. That's really important, actually. Um, 
The New York West Side Peacemake Project, which you had mentioned before, was actually, you know, something that came out of doing all these workshops with people. It's like, we, we desperately need to make these spaces. Like, we have to make spaces where people can heal. We have to make some alternative spaces. And so I approached the Center for Court Innovation. They're based in New York City. They innovate around courts. Like, I didn't really know you could innovate around courts, but you can. Um, and what they were doing was bringing Native American peacemaking practices into a non-Native community for the first time in the United States. We've been deploying the European model to our First Nations people forever and ever, and they are reignite, they're like, you know, kind of screw you. We're gonna reignite our indigenous practices because we know they work. Um, and the Center for Corn Innovation was like, well, maybe we should import them back the other way. Uh, and so they, I approached them and said, well, look, what can we, uh, make a center? Can we work with the community to make a peacemaking center? Like, you can do peacemaking, but where are you going to do it? And they said, okay, well, let's do that. Um, and so this is a first sort of peacemaking project that we have. Um, and it's in the near west side of Syracuse, New York. It's a very uh, a community that is so rich in diversity, but, you know, very lacking in resources. And uh, a lot of immigrant population coming there, coming from countries that, in conflict. So uh, you have all these people mixed in there. And then, of course, Syracuse, uh, in a way, is a socioeconomically depressed community, uh, aside from the school and the university. And these are some of the communities that have been left behind. Uh, so what I did with my peacemaking training was started to run something called the peacemaking palette, where I would mimic the process of peacemaking, Native American peacemaking, and people would bring an object, a color, a material, and tell a story about a space where they felt calm and at peace. And then we would have them role play as victim, offender, or a community member about what kind of environments. Walk me through what kind of space you would need to go through to get to that. Um, and then we also um, diagrammed that. And I was able to do that with many people and code and analyze that data to actually come up with a set of design guidelines for a peacemaking space because we never have one. Has anyone been in a peacemaking center before? You know, it's like, what does one even look like, right? If you, I don't know. So this was a really necessary process to figure out what that was. Um, it's done, it's up and running. What happened was the community was able to identify a neutral space in the community. Uh, this was an old drug house that we turned into a center for peacemaking. It's called the Near West Side Peacemaking Project. And they're doing now over 80 cases a year. It just opened. And what's happening is that people are coming to the center and when they get there, it is the environment itself that's convincing them to engage in peacemaking for the first time. Right, so you can tell somebody on the phone that you're, they're going to come do peacemaking, but people don't know what that is. And so what happens, in this case, uh, Sheila and her daughter, who had been in severe conflict in the community with many people, her daughter also had been molested by a member of the family, so there was multiple family uh, violence going on. There was also uh, aggression with other members of the community. They had been sent to peacemaking, so the DA and the prosecutor said, look, we think this is a good case for peacemaking, and they didn't want to do it. And this is not very common. I don't want to do peacemaking. It's just like going to court. How is it any different? And uh, they arrived here because they, in a way, felt they had no choice, and they were very stressed, and they were very anxious. Uh, and when Sheila came into the space, she's, she looked around, she's like, I feel, I feel really comfortable and calm here. You know, I feel at ease. Um, it kind of is like being home. And so, for the first time, it kind of occurred to us, like, well, imagine if justice looked like coming home. Like, what is that? That's sort of, sort of a radical concept. And so since working with Sheila and talking to Sheila, we really talked to hundreds of people around the country about what would make a space for peacemaking. And I'll just share a few of what we've learned. We have a paper coming out soon with the Vera Institute, uh, which outlines a lot of the research outcomes. Uh, but one thing we know is that peacemaking spaces need to be neutral, uh, safe, and protected that the spaces themselves can be circular and non-hierarchical, unlike a courtroom, that you need to have views to nature in order to modulate fight, flight, and freeze responses that are a natural way of us uh, adapting to any time we are in conflict, and that you need to actually have spaces for people to run to when they do get that way. So there's always this idea of chill-out space and chill-out room that buffers the space. Spaces are totally buffered in some way by other programs. 
uh, that they're objects that you can see and touch, working on like the work of Peter Levine. If you know his work and sort of somatic experiencing, you're able to look around the room and you'll be able to calm yourself by your eye resting on objects of interest, but you have to navigate the, the chaos with calm. Uh, color, obviously lots of light and texture. And then you always have to have a kitchen. It's absolutely necessary. You have to have one. Every peacemaking space has to have a kitchen and a place to break bread. RJ City. How do we get to amplify the work? Yeah. <laughs> you laugh at my slide. No, no, I was just thinking about uh, we were uh, uh, able to get out to Detroit uh, a couple of five times actually earlier this year to work on an RJ City project. Um, the RJ City project is a, a mapping tool that seeks to create uh, what we call an asset audit to understand on a city-wide level or neighborhood-wide level um, the various r restorative justice assets. Um, the funny story that I was chuckling about is we made some good friends there. Uh, Black Family Development is a tremendous organization. If you find yourself in Detroit, they're good people to know. They asked us to participate in a, a peace walk. So we arrive at Eight Mile Road. And I'm like, oh, I know Eight Mile. I saw the movie. And they're like, oh, Deanna and Kyle from Oakland, California here. You want to say hi to the people? And we're like, okay, we grab the microphone and was uh, able to engage in, in, in the community and it was, it was a meaningful experience and good friends and we'll be back out there. Um, so, you know, the, the two, Detroit's the one city that we're probably going to uh, really do this thing in. We started in Oakland. Um, this sort of mapping that came out of this idea is that a restorative justice city is more than just about justice. Um, it's about engaging people in the development of of user-centric services. It's about food justice. It's about restorative economics. Uh, it's about facilitating restorative dialogue in the public realm. Um, I give a whole extra talk about this one, but you know, this is a map we created with the Institute for the Future. Future is based in Palo Alto around what would we need to create a restorative justice city. Uh, we mapped it out in Oakland, a sort of distributed network of, of resources through the flatlands uh, that we would need. And what was exciting about the process is that a project came out of it, a new prototype, a new alternative came out of it. I'll let you talk about Yeah, so uh, this is uh, the Fruit Vale. It's one block away from the BART. It's an existing project that we are adaptively reusing to create what will be, I believe, the country's first restorative justice and restorative economics hub. Um, so there's a couple components to it. On the restorative justice side of things, the restorative justice practitioners in Alameda County will be able to hold cir uh, circles there in a dedicated space, very similar to the one that Deanna showed a couple slides ago. I'll show, there it is. Oh, there it is, <laughs> thanks. Um, is it back? Yeah. Okay, uh, the Ella Baker Center uh, will have their corporate offices there. They do human rights advocacy and Rock United trains low-wage restaurant workers to get front-of-the-house jobs. Um. And our goal really is that um, we will be able to replicate this model in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and New Orleans. Yeah, it's a great platform, uh, as Rock United is national with their various chapters in a lot of different cities. There are very in favor of trying to take this model, which will be a restaurant anchored space, and then whatever restorative justice practitioner is in that city combined there with them. So it's very exciting, and uh, we go into construction in November. Yeah. So the Pop-Up Resource Village, I think, is um, the last major project that we'll talk about that we have. Uh, the Pop-Up Resource Village, uh, really is in response to the fact that a lot of the communities we're working in, we were still losing people every week, right? Building a building is a heavy lift. It's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Uh, and every week, even just a few weeks ago, uh, people were getting shot. Right? So gun violence, uh, police brutality, and incarceration, and that we really needed to do something that was faster and lighter on its feet. Uh, so the mobile architecture solution emerged. Um, in the form of what we're calling the pop-up resource village. And you know, what it is, is really a gathering of mobile resources. Um, everything from mobile medical, um, social services, mobile education, uh, micro-entrepreneurship, 
entrepreneurship through pop-up shops. We'll show you a couple of the units. And the idea is to activate blighted space and support community cohesion because we know that community cohesion is really the thing that makes communities safe and resilient. So this is what's in a pop-up resource village. A bunch of people. These are the people that the community identified. You know, these are the different sectors that, that will be covered, so it's a lot. Uh, and then we are making the thing. So, I mean, we're not delivering programs. DJDS isn't. We're making the stuff that will activate this. And these are some of the things that we are making. Uh, we call them mobile site components, uh, mobile vending units, uh, small trucks, and actually uh, transforming buses. So any, by any means necessary. Um, and the pop-up shops are really, uh, the bottom, bottom left is one that, a model that will be going into production soon. It's a prototype. Um, and the idea is that we're working with the Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center to get onboard vendors, very low-income vendors. So Kyle gets back into the, to the arena that he was in before and that we are able to make these sort of units that will get deployed on site and popped up in a whole variety of ways. We have like four prototypes under production now. Fun and activities, so recreation on site. This is Spark Truck. I don't know if you guys seen Spark Truck from Stanford, but we'll also have uh, San Francisco's library bookmobile and also their tech mobile, so that will also be showing up on site. Wanna talk about our health and wellness? Uh, sure, so we're gonna <laughs> uh, invite the Kaiser and they have a whole fleet of different vehicles that do everything from mammograms to then um, primary care. Uh, really, the village is open to all folks who are providing services um, to communities. <clears throat> food is a big deal, of course, like food is critical to all our projects actually. We're gonna just have to have a whole other restorative agriculture section to DJDS because it's in every single project that we do. Um, and then the converted buses, one is finished and we'll show it to you and, and I'll show you a couple of them. I don't recommend using very old buses anymore but that's what we did and we turned these into space that looks like these. Uh, these sort of spaces of refuge um, that got stripped out and turned into, this is the library. But this is the Five Keys mobile classroom. And what it does is it brings GED and high school education uh, into many communities where people are returning to their community from jail. So they start with the curriculum in jail. Jail's a shorter term stay. And then what was happening is they were losing their students. And we know that access to advanced education is one of the greatest predictors of reduced recidivism. So getting access to education is critical if we want to end mass incarceration. So uh, this vehicle will travel across turf lines. Turf lines were an issue, cost of public transport, no public transport. Um, and so 15 students can ride on the bus, and you have seen it. It also, all this stuff slides and moves so they can actually hold AA meetings in there and do restorative justice circles in there. So everything is flexible and movable. Um, and it's on the road and it's going to serve over 3,000 students per year. So this amplification, right, through very light infrastructure is already being tested. Um, and I'll just talk about the Women's Resource Center. Um, this is another bus that we're going to turn into a, a resource center or a refuge for women released from jail in the middle of the night when they are at their most vulnerable and also will anchor the village during the day. So I work with about 65 women at county jail number two, not too far from here, um, and went in uh, making a lot of assumptions that, oh, you're at least in the middle of the night, you're going to want beds, and they were super clear that that's exactly not what they wanted, um, and they told us exactly what they needed. Uh, it was a week-long workshop, so we did about 40 hours of seat time. It was very intensive. Um, and they were like, you know, we just want a place where we can, we can rest, where we can get on the phone, we can find my family, where am I going to go after this and the next day? Uh, a change of clothes, because they're released in the clothes they were arrested in. Um, they want to just, you know, I'm like, look, I just want to do my hair and makeup and, and just look decent so I can face the world. Like, I'm not trying to sleep. Um, and so we created a whole series of zones in, the, in this 40-foot-long vehicle, um, and we will begin construction next soon. We've got to find a better vehicle, but it'll be something like this. Um, and so they all wanted recliners, so what you're seeing here is this idea of what, actually the image of what they wanted. Uh, we're also working with them to both to fabricate a lot of the textiles and the interiors of, of the vehicle. Um, and when we return to them to sort of be like, hey, is this what we, you said that you we wanted? Is this what, are we hearing you? They're like, yeah, you're hearing us. And so the process was working quite well. Uh, we will be uh, popping up in full next summer. 
um, in various spots in the Bayview Hunters Point. And, um, you know, we've, we've had some good news today, which I'm not allowed to talk about, but it's good news, and you'll hear about it in December. But it allows us to really do this project in the very full way uh, over the next two years. So, so be looking out for it. Oh, peace play. Uh, <laughs> so this is a good tie into uh, Deanna's prior work with The Witness, which was, and we sort of stepped back and thought, you know, okay, these projects are very expensive, they take a long time. How, again, can we start to uh, amplify and scale our work? So the idea of if we are into creating places, sure, that could be in the physical realm, but it could also be digital. Um, so we had a great workshop earlier this year to think through how might we create a video game that incorporated many of our, our mission uh, objectives. So uh, Peace Play, as it stands right now, will be an intervention to interrupt the school to prison pipeline. Uh, what we know is that there is this very clear pathway for student suspensions that then end up in in incarceration, and it's a very big problem that is affecting the communities that we are most concerned with, in particular black men and boys. So um, Peace Play will be an environment where folks can kind of relax in the video game and hopefully be able to return back to their classrooms and avoid that suspension. And we're working with Games for Change on that, so cool, super cool organization, just check them out, they're amazing, they're amazing. Uh, creating Home is a, is a residential project. Uh, what's interesting about Creating Home is that, again, it's an intervention in trying to keep people out of prison. So the focus is on transitional-aged youth. Transitional-aged youth are young people who have aged out of the foster care system. So this is people who are about 18 to 25 years old. They're trying to enter adulthood, hopefully successfully, but with foster kids, it doesn't really work out that well. Homelessness is a reality. Poverty is almost guaranteed. And unfortunately, incarceration too. So if we look nationally at the, at the prison population, 70, 70% of the people who are incarcerated spend some time in foster care. So that's not to say a whole lifetime or childhood in foster care, but maybe a short amount of time. Um, so we are working with a couple of organizations here in the Bay Area, one in particular is the First Place for Youth, that believes that housing is the way to get folks on the right path. It's a, what they call a housing first strategy. If you can provide people with a place to live, then you can start to address the trauma, put in education, the workforce development, all of those things can happen afterwards. So creating home is essentially a supportive housing model that will have, of course, housing, but then the supportive services that are needed to help these young people successfully transition to adulthood. Yeah, we'll just roll things last yeah, too quickly. I mean, it. Digital Bridge is a, um, uh, an idea for a center that bridges the digital divide um, in a way that is really focused on design and fabrication, right? So we have a lot of like, black girls code, code for America, everyone's coding. But you know, there's this very specific area where it's tied into making and fabrication that we think is a real gap, especially in the Bay Area where we have a lot of that and sort of the economic opportunities that are being missed out by generally low-income communities of color uh, who don't have access to the technology and the resources that could get them into those fields and those industries. So Digital Bridge is hoping to pilot here in the Bayview and uh, potentially at a site Kyle will show you um, in the East Bay. All right, so this is uh, downtown Oakland. Uh, the smaller building is where we would like to put Digital Bridge. It's uh, right now an existing 20,000 square foot loft building that is obsolete essentially. Um, a church owns it, the pastor occupies maybe 500 square feet of this entire building, and it's a perfect opportunity to be able to, um, again, address this digital divide, which is not so much access to technology or high-speed internet, but can you do something with this technology? Can you work at Google? Can you make stuff? Can you participate in the modern economy? Another shot of the, of the building. So yeah, we know Kyle and I have been really trying hard to help uh, 
organizations co-develop and acquire their property. I mean, mm. this, this project really is at the edge of gentrification in Oakland. We have Tent City on one side and we have Uber on the other. And, you know, it, Kyle was in court today listening to deliberations from the judge about who's going to yeah. get the property and what better. I mean, it's really this sort of fight uh, to get capital into the hands of people who don't have capital, even being to people who don't have a lot of capital ourselves. So it's been an interesting journey. Um, a creative process of financing and building relationships is what we spend a lot of time doing. Um, so that's our presentation of our work um, and would love to, I know it's kind of a rich array, uh, answer any <laughs> questions you might have uh, by our by any means necessary approach. I think a, a rich array is putting it mildly. I don't know. Do you how do, you're working 120 hour weeks? I think. No, I mean just you've got so much going on. It's fabulous. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I have some questions, as we said uh, earlier, that uh, were assembled by our fifth year students taking our professional practice class. Um, so I want to ask some of those, and then we are going to save some time a little later for questions from the audience, too. Um, so I'll start here. Um, defining social justice uh, can be a very personal topic based on interpretation, values, and experience. How do each of you define that, define social justice for yourselves? Uh, if, I were to, if I were to define it today, I've been thinking a lot about um, the government's role and how it either can enforce uh, and affirm either justice or inequality. So I've been reading this book called The Color of Law, something you guys should definitely pick up, but it chronicles basically U.S. housing policy from Reconstruction to the current day. And what we see there is policy affecting so much of our built environment. Pretty much most of the United States was built or at least the part that we can see from Reconstruction to now. And um, it's a bit of a challenge, you know, from our perspective to see the injustices. Um, it's already in concrete, literally. And how can we make meaningful change for something that is so integrated and, you know, literally a part of our, our lives? So. Uh, to me, a lot of social justice is, is, about, is about fairness, and um, we know that, especially when talking about the built environment, much of it is unfair. Um, buildings are largely built for uh, the rich and powerful, and often used to oppress uh, folks who are not, and very often communities of color. I feel the same way as Kyle. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I think that uh, when I think about it, I always view it through the lens of let's look at the systems at play and who created them and who are they serving. Um, because they work really well for some people. They really do. The criminal justice system works awesome for some people. Um, and so sort of finding your passion and the piece that you are most excited about and then looking at the system or the problem. So social justice is just looking at systems and being like, are they equal? Are they equitable? Are they just? Um, and uh, people say, oh, social justice. It's almost like social justice. Do they go together? They don't often. So what does it look like to put those two words together? Um, yeah. yeah. Good point. I'm going to ask you each just an individual question, and we'll go back to kind of group questions. But Kyle, how does development and having real estate skills support the restorative justice mission that you have? How does it support the restorative justice mission that you have? Oh, it's, uh, I think one of the, the great things about being able to develop uh, spaces, infrastructure for restorative justice is that a lot of folks are not really familiar with it. So to the extent that we can create these three-dimensional representations that people can see on the corner to participate in circles is a great way of not only amplifying uh, the philosophy of restorative justice, but also the peacemaking itself. So it is, um, 
a, a tremendous privilege to be able to be involved in the creation of such new spaces so that they hopefully will become something that you might study in architecture school, uh, suggest to your next client as a way to use space for purposes that do promote a, a, a fairness and equity that, that Deanna was talking about a second ago. Great, thanks. And uh, Deanna, where and how do you find design inspiration? Um, who inspires you from the realm of architecture? Oh, who inspires if, me if, from if, the if realm anyone. of architecture? <laughs> I don't know, some people do. Some people do. I'm like trying to think who I get really excited about. It's the communities. Mainly, I get excited by the communities. Like, I get more excited by working with people than I ever do of other architects. I just like, uh, you know, the work we do. With, you know, anytime I go in to work with incarcerated students, I get super excited. We were just working with seniors for the first time in the Bayview Hunters Point. They were great. One woman, she was homeless, right? She'd been made homeless that day. She was still in our, our workshop. And she had awesome ideas. I mean, super inspiring and smart, you know. And, I, and my, the intern we had had never done that work before. And he's like, wow, you know, I'll spend a week in studio banging my head trying to come up with a concept. And just doing this work today, in 20 minutes, we came up with some awesome stuff that I never would have thought of. Uh, so pulling the creativity out of people, the innate creativity, is pretty inspiring and exciting. And I, there's no architect that gets me as jazzed as doing that, so. <laughs> Great. Um, obviously, in your presentation, we see that you're taking design and design thinking and questioning into prisons and jails. What, for you, is the most important outcome of that process? These are good questions, Mimi. Um, I know. Oh, the, oh, these are the students. Oh, you guys came up with some good questions. Oh, I didn't realize you were just the voice. I was like, they're all typed up and they're all formalized there. I might have cleaned it up a little Okay, got it, got it, got it. What is the best outcome or the idealized outcome or the most important, most important outcome? For, for me, I, I'm less interested in what is, I mean, for me, I just want to um, empower the people that we're working with. So if they feel empowered, I feel, I feel good. Uh, I think that's what they, you know, if you're incarcerated, you're sitting in there and you're like, I'm having no impact. Like they want to do something. They want to have impact. So when you work with them and, and they feel like, wow, I did this and this has some meaning, they're always asking me like, well, what's going to happen? Are you really good? Remember we were in that thing in, in, um, outside of Detroit, the prison outside of Detroit? And like, so you're really going to make these things? Like, like yeah, we're going to make them. I mean, if you think about the, the situation Deanna was talking about, we were with a room full of men who were juvenile life offenders. So here I am, I'm like 45, sitting next to these other guys, about the same age. They've been in prison for, since they were 17 in the state of Michigan, some maybe 20. And if you can think about someone whose life has gone that way and their experience with the built environment, where did they grow up? What did that environment look like? I'm sure it was not a country club. What has the court process been like? Chances are, you know, they were involved uh, at the precinct, and then now spending a lifetime in prison is, uh, well, trauma is maybe a simple way to put it, but uh, it's quite complex. So for them to be able to start to think about alternatives um, was a way for their mind and maybe even to just leave the physical confines of the prison and start to envision how life might be uh, different, maybe for some of their relatives as they're not ever going to leave. But, um, you know, it's yeah. quite so an experience. Sort of following up on that, when you first meet these people, are you received with skepticism? Are you received in any negative way? Or are people generally kind of actually open and excited about what you're going to engage them in? It depends. It really depends. We had some big problems at San Quentin, actually, when we went in there to do that work. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, there was a bit of tension around the project and that they thought we were working with... Uh, uh, the men there to design a better prison, like right? helping them to redesign their cage to be more beautiful, and that's not what we were doing, but that's what people thought. 
Uh, it depends on who uh, who's our ambassador going in, like for the place that Kyle was talking about. We had really strong ambassadors, had a good rela long standing relationships and um, also better relationship with the correctional officers. It really depends. They, each place is different and very complex in its dynamics. You've talked about um, the Peacemaking Center, which is really exciting. Um, or did you talk about the Peacemaking Room too or just the Peacemaking Center? No, I can't Didn't remember. Didn't do the room. Didn't do the room. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the room. What do you find, let's talk about the room. What do you find are the most important architectural attributes that need to be part of that room in order for that activity to be successful, if, if it can support in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think intention matters, right? So intentionality, as you sit down to do the process, uh, that this is going to be a space for peacemaking, that it's dedicated, right? So it's not even a physical thing, right? It's like this space is only for that. We don't you know, have a classroom in here, we don't do a bunch of other things, that this is what happens here, and that's all that happens here. And that you know when you come there, you know, that it's calm, and it needs to feel comfortable, and something familiar, and um, almost always there's this sort of chill out zone, this calm zone with like pillows and soft chairs and things like that, where you can just be over there. Um, and there's always artwork, and there's always like, you know, a organic, things in the space, but really it's about dedicating it, you know, that that's what this space is for. Mm -hmm. It's been pretty powerful just to do that all by itself. Mm -hmm. I tell people like, don't, even if you don't do anything to the space, just make sure that's what happens there. And that's all that happens there. And everybody always knows, like I can go there anytime. And that's what the place is for. I and mean, if you imagine that in your life, where do you go when you want to feel calm? Do you, you probably have a place that you go if you think about it. Are you finding a desire to replicate more peacemaking rooms? I know that one was in, is in a high school, is, am I correct? Yeah, it's that in Castlemine High School, yeah. yeah. Um, are there others planned? Has that sort of been a springboard to any other schools that have yeah, seen you do yeah. that? Yeah, there are more schools doing it all over the country. We, have a, we created design guidelines for creating source, restorative spaces in schools. You can get it on their website. It's a little booklet. We've d disseminated it, and, and people are doing it. People are doing it, and we may be doing a whole school in Detroit, a whole restorative. What does a restorative justice school look like? Mm -hmm. So it would be an entire school that would be founded on those principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that Detroit is a very exciting place to, to be working in that uh, real estate is, is very different than it is here in California. Yeah. They've got a lot of it. So our program partners, I mentioned black family development a little while ago. They're like, yeah, we can get a school. No problem. You know, they're Your just shutting down. Your dollar goes a little further. And then the yeah, Bay we'll Detroit Public Schools. We'll get a school. They just closed five down. We'll, just we'll get, get one. We'll just I'm get thinking, a school. That'll be like $30 million in California, but... You can do that in Detroit. Do you get involved in that in the capacity of with the school districts as well? Is that say in Oakland because that's where that is? Is the school district participating, supporting this effort, or is it really kind of going just to the school administration? And yeah, you know, getting involved with the school like we did that on the down low. I got to be really honest oh, okay. with you. Oh. Like that was a down low project. You know. Well, it's important to know yeah. like what <laughs> level are you. Yeah coming into mm -hmm. the school and, and getting that yeah. participation. Yeah. And it depends, yeah. right? Yeah. Sometimes it's higher level, you know, like with Detroit, we will be coming into the school district. It won't be so down low. We did meet, actually meet with someone from the school district in, in Detroit running all their programs, and we talked to him. So uh, it really depends on the context. Oakland's a little stickier, and you don't want to kind of, you know, as soon as you start to do work in schools, you have to go through the, uh, you know, the state architects, and, you know, they want to know. And so we kind of just did it. Sometimes you just got to do it and then ask questions you. later. Right. <laughs> ask for forgiveness later. Yeah, yeah. sorry, the forgiveness part. That's right. I, I, forgiveness I know about later. that, sorry, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> um, you've touched on this in your presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about the role of design and architecture and healing and helping support yeah. healing. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how, how much evidence based design research you all are doing here at the school. Um, we did a quite a bit of it, yeah. particularly in healthcare facilities, we started to look at initially, um, and also uh, in schools, right? The, the research that had been done, and we did draw from that. Mm -hmm. um, but what we know is that uh, the creation of these spaces is really helping. Uh, 
people find places of refuge, which is very much needed for calming the nervous system. So any, even in the healthcare research, half of it is about reducing the heart rate and calming you down. So navigating like the parasympathetic nervous system and, and using pretty uh, standard things that we know that, that do that. So it, it's a refuge, right? So you know you go there and that's what's going to happen there, it's calming. Um, and then really starting to pull on this other, in the, in the I mentioned Peter Levine's work in doing uh, traumatic and somatic stuff, we're learning a lot from that. So we're drawing from a range of research methodologies to bring them into the spaces that we are doing. Um, and really I think the exciting thing now is to just get people to test these things out you know, and to see how they work. And the evaluation piece is where we're at now, right? How do we evaluate the outcomes and get hard, quantitative, qualitative data, uh, which we only now have funding for for the Papa Resource Village, which is great. Um, but I think for Restore, we'll really be trying to, make, to test out these spaces and see what impact they're having uh, from a, a harder research perspective, not just uh, anecdotal. Right. I was going to ask you about that sort of what have you been able to glean from any post occupancy, as we call it, in the, in yeah. the you know, that we'll, kind we'll of have post occupancy uh, data actually in a few weeks from the Center for Court Innovation on the Peacemaking Center. Right. So it's about to come out. So I can't wait to share it with the whole world. I'm sure it's going to be good. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Um, you did show the Five Keys mobile classroom. I did mention to. Deanna and Kyle, that um, Tuesday when I was at one of my site uh, construction meetings and walking around the site, Hunters Point West, um, I looked up and in front of our community room was this beautiful green bus. And I went, they're here. <laughs> they, they actually made it over here. This is great. What do you hope that bus will do for that community in particular? Or do you have goals for that? where the bus stops and... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one thing I hope, you may have a, a different hope, I really hope that it, it supports um, healing around uh, the environment of learning, right? So I think a lot of communities we work in have had traumatic experiences in school. I had traumatic experiences growing up in school. And, and it's pretty serious, right? It's pretty intense to the point that people don't want to go to school. Like five keys, it's, if you don't have a GED and high school diploma and you are incarcerated in the San Francisco County jail system, you have to go to class. And they just came out with a movie called The Corridor. And you can see them, I don't, they didn't want to go in there, right? It was traumatizing. School was a place of shaming and abuse. And so if this vehicle can come up and actually make people think differently about going to school, which is, I think, what it's already kind of doing, because the executive director said people are pulling themselves out of the bricks and mortar sites to come to school on this bus, <laughs> which I, <laughs> was, I am surprised at, um, then we would have been, that would be a huge success. Any, you have anything to add to that one? That's the big one for me. Yeah, very exciting. If I see it, I'm going to get on it next get time. Um, so here's another question from students. Design represents itself as, in quotes, a serious endeavor. Can we activate a sense of playfulness that provides an alternative benefit? I think so. I think so. I mean, we're making, we're making, we're making video games, people. I mean, that's <laughs> like, you know, and we play games with people. Um, and I would, when we did the workshop at the women's uh, jail, I had them do a full body mock-up of, of what the bus environment by, might be like. And so I had everybody stretched across and we were using, because we couldn't build stuff in there. So we were using our bodies to understand. So if I'm here and you're there, I was like, this is how wide the bus is. So how close do you want to be if you're chilling or whatever? And then we turned that into a, um, a soul train line and people were dancing down the middle and it was like this sort of really fun moment. And I mean, I really could have gotten us all in a lot of trouble, so I don't recommend that. The correctional officer was looking the other way when that happened. Um, but it was fun and it really, the process lightened things up. Um, and then to bring video games into the environment as well. And like one of those images has a FU wall, which is in the restorative justice space. That's what the youth wanted, to be able to graffiti in there and to express themselves. So the white wall the yeah, white the white wall. wall. Yeah, that's what they asked for and to draw on that. So there is a sense of playfulness. We're also working on a punching bag, hug, a punching hug bag, which is like a boxing thing. I'm totally making this this year. I'm telling you right now that it's like a, a, a punching bag that's uh, wrapped in velvet. 
So you can hit it when you're angry, but you can also like hold it, you know? <laughs> so like s objects like that need to be in these spaces. And as architects and designers, we can think at this multi-scalar level. It's not just the building, but it's like everything that goes into it. We can just stay creative all the time. It's not gonna cost much to make that. We'll totally make it and install it at ReStore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How does, um, how does acoustics play into, say, the, the, the spaces that you design? How is that an important aspect of, of supporting, again, the, the, either the conversation or the uh, engagement? Let me talk about acoustics. I can tell you how much they cost. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the money guy. <laughs> I was like, that's expensive stuff. It's expensive. Yeah, I mean, you know, acoustics are critical because you can't, you don't want people to hear what's going on. Also, it's interesting you mentioned acoustics because inside of incarcerated situations, acoustics is one of the most damaging and stressful things that, that really um, hurt people. Mm -hmm. The lighting is really bad on people, but the acoustics is, is brutal. Um, so thinking about that in our spaces is, is critical, and, but it is expensive. I mean, right now, it just got VE'd out of, and the whole acoustic thing, just the people just like, took it all out. I'm like, well, you got to put it back in because you can't function without it. You got to have it in there. So, yeah, it's important. Yeah. You know, it's part of the deal. How are we doing on time, timekeeper? I'm just going to, I'm just checking. Because I know I don't really care either because I've got a lot more. Okay. Okay, okay great. All right, good. Okay. Okay, here's your one. Um, you've worked in a lot of different communities, obviously. So you can pick one, and I'm thinking about this question. Cause <laughs> but the question is, what are the positive effects on the community that you have seen? Is there a metric, metrics, to measure your success? In terms of community engagement? They don't say, but let's start there. Well, we just were on the phone today with our evaluator, Barb Taves, who's evaluating our process. Uh, and we are we have surveys that we do at the end of all of our our things now that we're we're going to be learning quite a bit about I would say for this year and early next year on the impact that our our process is having specifically in the Bayview Hunters Point mm -hmm. like what did you think of this experience you know what did you get out of doing this thing with us um, and so we'll be able to answer and we've never done that before um, and. Uh, I'll be very curious to see what, what comes out of it. You know, our hope is that people feel like they have a sense of agency, mm -hmm. you know, um, which I think agency is a big deal. Like people feel like they have no agency in the built environment and they kind of haven't based on what Kyle was saying before. In, for that event in particular, I'll call it a workshop for lack of a better mm -hmm. name. Is it a one day thing? Is it a multiple, is it over a couple of weeks or can you describe sort of, and then part two of that question is, how do you keep those people engaged? Do the same people come back, or do you find new people coming? Yeah. It depends, it really depends. You know, right now we are doing all different kinds of people. And actually we also did, I, we did do evaluations on the workshops we did inside of prisons and jails, and people, you know, what came, did come out of that was, you know, people feeling like they had a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I felt really heard and I felt respected. And for us, that is a valuable tool for people to feel going forward. And, you know, with the Bayview, we are trying to uh, meet people over and over again. But I have to tell you, it's uh, hard to do community engagement. It is not easy. I mean, there are days where I'm just like, we ain't doing this anymore. You know, this is tough stuff. People don't come, and then you, you do all this work, and then some people come, and then, you know, whatever. I mean, it, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say maybe on the less scientific data, but when clients call us back with new ideas, that's a positive sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were very excited to uh, meet the sheriff of San Francisco. That, mm -hmm. that meeting was set up because our partners, the Five Keys Schools and Programs, the ones who have the bus, um, said, hey, you know, listen, we want to introduce you to the sheriff. They have a women's resource center that they'd like to convert into this residential workforce development thing. Can you just meet with the sheriff? And we did, and you know, let's see what happens, but we'll, I've got some homework to do tomorrow to finish up this proposal, but you know, it's good when folks uh, try to plug us into new projects. And it's tied to the bus, the women's resource bus. So we're going back in. So in that way, we will be going back to the same community. I would, I prefer when we don't see the same people inside. 
-hmm. and they're different, but sadly, so they're sometimes the same. Yeah, that, I think that's really exciting. Like you said, that if clients are coming back to you or referring you to other, you know, potential new clients, that, that something is sparking, yeah, right, a positive reaction. That's great. Um, the Restorative Justice Center that's coming, you said the end of, starting construction the end of next month? Yeah, it'll run uh, from November of this year to late next year. Okay. Um, so, again, just my curiosity back to any city level engagement in that, or is that a down low project too? <laughs> can't do that one down low. Uh, city leaders, I guess. Are, are you getting support from City of Oakland or other, you know? I would have uh, liked more, to be honest with you. There was all kinds of opportunities for money, expedited permitting, mm -hmm. but uh, what we're finding is with many of our projects, these are, are privately sponsored, so whether that's our private foundations, uh, social impact investors. Um, but it's a good point, though, because I think that is our, our holy grail, uh, which is how to begin to divert public money, this is government funding, to support alternatives to courthouses, jails, prisons, detention centers. You want to talk about your meeting with the, with the DA of San Francisco? Oh yeah, it was really, it was kind of actually the impetus for s just really following some up on some of this work was the, the DA's office called us in and said, look, we have $300 million. I'm sure you guys have seen some of this publicity around the jail, right? The jail that they wanted to build uh, here and people have been really fighting it. And they were like, well, what do we build instead, right? If we don't build a $300 million jail, what do we do with the money? And it was like this... The, Bell went, I'm like, you guys don't know what to build instead? That's a problem. Yeah. The problem that you're asking me what to build. There's no strategic plan on what to build. There's no, like, you should know exactly what we need to build. For $300 million, we could build 30 restores. Yeah, so, you know, advance us 10 years, the idea for us would be to have these built projects that have been evaluated that are now sort of maybe even worked into some policy, mm -hmm. so that way when 300 million of unallocated capital appears, that the DA isn't confused about what to do. They think, oh, okay, well we can do this type of project, this type of project, et cetera, and then we'll retire. Right. <laughs> what money, Kyle? <laughs> I was gonna say, I don't think you will just from your own passion, though. <laughs> The work will be done. <laughs> 300 million is a lot of money to not have a yeah. plan for. Uh, well, they have a plan knowing that that's not, if our strategy is to decarcerate, then we can't build more beds. We're just going to fill the beds, right? Again, we build what we believe, the action you take in a certain direction, you actually manifest it, so. Okay, there's a student in the audience who wants to ask a question. Excellent. Um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, the question here um, I want to ask is, where do you find the power, or where do you find the strength um, to fight for social justice when those in power around you don't see the value in it? Like how do you navigate through the power? Um, seems you two are very committed to be a social justice fighter. Um. Good question. <laughs> um, we're just coming off of a very affirming moment, which was uh, we're members of a, a fellowship called Echoing Green. Check it out, apply love these guys, but they have been sponsoring social entrepreneurs for the last 30 years, and there's a huge cohort of uh, alumni who have done fabulous things in entrepreneurship and social justice. Names you maybe have heard of, like Teach for America and City Year, have all kind of grown out of the Echoing Green Fellowship. So anyway, every year they have an annual conference, and it was in San Francisco two weekends ago, and to walk into a room with, you know, 300 social entrepreneurs who are doing everything from climate change to working with communities is very affirming to know that we're not alone and that we're part of a 
very powerful network of, of like-minded individuals who are all trying to change the world in you know, their own special way. And you know, part of the, the conference is start learning about self-care, right? so that you're taking care of yourself within the context of the work. Not that I do it so great, but I'm aware that it needs to be done and I do my best with it. Um, as a Kyle, Kyle always just stops, like he's like a little machine that runs out of batteries, so he stops. And I just kind of break and fall apart. So we're trying to avoid that because if you don't take care of yourself, that is kind of what will happen. So building community of support uh, and doing a lot of self-care work. I'm going to ask one more question and I'll open up. I just wanted to go back to your, you mentioned, um, and I may not say this correctly, circle, circle, what's the right word? Circle, circle keeper? Cir keeper, thank circle you, that's keeper, the word. Peace, peacekeeper, circle, circle keeper yeah. training or circle keeper. Can you talk a little bit more about what, what that is and yeah, how does one, how does one do that? Anybody can do it. Anybody, you, you all can do it. A community works west and restorative justice for Oakland youth do great trainings. If you all have any desire to learn how to be a restorative justice circle keeper, um, I find that, like we learned in Detroit, that they're actually training entire police force folks, they're training teachers to do it, um, and that it's actually a valuable tool you can take back in your own families and friends and in the relationships that you have and learning how to have those kinds of dialogues. And you know, you sort of you do a lot of role playing during the training, you know. I've seen some incredible role playing being done in, in Syracuse that almost felt like you were in a real thing. Like you kind of get taken over by the role you're playing and you really experience the power of the circle and what happens when uh, people are within a structure of respect and listening and holding. So yeah, I, I highly recommend getting a training like that. They do three day trainings. You can do a one day introductory training. But yeah, it's well worth, worth doing. I need to do more training. Like I'm sure I suck now, but I'm gonna. <laughs> Yeah, I have not been practicing my circle. Well, we do now have circles on Monday morning in the office. We do. Yeah. I think that sounds like a great routine. It is. Yeah. yeah. I do want to open up to the audience to see if there are some burning questions out here. And, of course, our online audience as well. <laughs> sure. So if anyone wants to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. And if online students are listening or online faculty are listening, all they have to do is type in um, and Eric Lum will translate your question straight to my phone and I'll be your voice. So, questions? First of all, Julia, I'm, not, I'm just going to say, Julia has worked with us for the last year and a half, so I know she had the question, but she's a plant, but she's amazing, and she has been helping us and supporting uh, the School on Wheels, both in its design and execution, and she has been to countless uh, restorative justice-y workshop-style events where she's been amazing. So I'm just going to give, I, I saw her, I'm like, I really Julia should give her a shout-out, but now I can give her a shout-out, so... Anyway, ask your question. I don't know why I ask question. You know the answer probably, but we'll see. Uh, so first of all, it's great to have you here. It's great to hear about all the work. Uh, and the question is about um, tr training, also training related. So, um, you know, participatory design, placemaking uh, is becoming more and more popular. And many students are uh, interested in doing this kind of job, uh, doing this kind of architecture. And you know, Alejandro Aravena getting a Pritzker Prize, and it's becoming very, uh, very sexy, very popular. Uh, and the question is, um, and um, doing workshops with you, uh, I have experienced uh, a great talent uh, of working with people, which is a skill that nobody actually teaches. So to pull creativity out of people and to pull the design out of communities is a great skill. Uh, and the question, uh, if you uh, have like advice for students who are interested in, uh, where would they go to learn it? Um, whom should they approach, uh, except from uh, designing justice, designing spaces? Yeah. It's funny, I was just thinking about you around this issue because we, at the Echoing Green conference, we met an Egyptian architect, um, his name is Rawa, 
and she's um, doing incredible work there and has a curriculum to train students to do that. And I was like, can you give it to me? I've asked her for it because I thought about you and I was I wanted to give it to you because you and I have been talking about this issue because it's a problem in that a lot of young people really want to get out and do community engagement work and then when they get there, they don't know how to do it and damage get, can get done. Um, and it's, it's something like, I'm like, how do you train it? And I think there's a, a slow process, Rodwa was saying, of getting to know one another, that it's actually, you don't just jump in and start doing workshops, you know, you actually have to really understand and learn from one another first as a relationship building process. So I'm gonna get that from Rodwa and I'm gonna give it to you. And then I think, is it Garrett? Oh, I've never remembered Garrett's last name. Garrett Jacobs. He just emailed me the other day. And Garrett Jacobs is trying to do that kind of training. So what is his organization, Jennifer? It's Jarrett, Garrett Jacobs. It's, it's no, now he's got a new thing. He's got a new thing he's doing where he is doing trainings for folks to, on how to do that community engagement piece, which I think is super super important to understand and know how to do. You have to be very, very careful. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes that I wish I hadn't, but learned the hard way. Um, so yeah, those are two things. So I'm gonna get you the curriculum from my colleague and then uh, Garrett Jacobs. Thank you, Open Architecture Collaborative. Use the technology. Yes, that is it. So definitely look them up, uh, definitely. He's really working hard. He really understands that question and is trying to, has a whole organization to do that. So I applaud the both of you for being here because you are an inspiration for our thesis students as well. And they come from an international realm. And the agenda, the agenda for their thesis is to express that aspect of social justice, especially the students that come here from China and the Middle East. And I just want to see if there's uh, experiences that you can share. So in a way, the training would be really powerful for them before they go back home. But how does a student in this short gig here gain the traction that you've gained? And the fact that Mimi and Jennifer fought you, brought you both here in a very timely moment, because there are those aspects in studio right now. Yeah. You know, there's... Um, it is a slow thing, right? Engaging communities is not fast. It is slow. So slow that I think we're coming to the end of our first year of the pop-up resource village and we are nowhere near in some ways where I was hoping we would be because it just takes time. Building relationships just takes time. Um, so there's no quick way to do it. Uh, I do think that just volunteering and spending time in a place with people is, is a good way to do it. You know, there's tons and tons of volunteer opportunities uh, around, and don't have an agenda about it. Like, I want to do this. But like, just go, and if you're lifting heavy things and moving them from the truck, that's helpful, right? There's uh, so many places and um, so many great volunteer opportunities in the Bay Area. And that's just a good way to start and just talk to people, you know, become good at asking questions. Uh, Marshall Gantz has a great, if you, if you want to look at community organizers, it's all about, com community organizers have more to teach than we could ever. We even hired a community organizer to do, to do the community outreach because that's what she does. And so doing community organizing training, volunteering with community organizers, I think is probably a better training than any architecture thing that you could do because they know how to talk to people, they know how to approach people. Ella Baker Center is amazing at, at talking to people. I've watched them do it. And they have a whole style and the way they talk and approach people. Like, how do you strike up a conversation with somebody you've never met? You're, not, you're from totally different walks of life. Um, and uh, how do you make yourself appear vulnerable, right? You need to be a little bit vulnerable. You need to share something about yourself. You have, need to have no agenda. Um, and be humble. You know, those are just some basic things. And so Marshall Gantz's work and his workshops are really great uh, and worth looking at. Uh, he does them everywhere. You know, I, I agree with you about the no agenda part, but that's what makes it difficult because you're sort of there because you want to do a project. 
<laughs> so how to modulate between, you know, what you might have raised Shut money up. for or <laughs> your own design intentions, then boom, you know, with the community is, is tricky. Uh, with the Housing Authority, I think probably what was very challenging is that I, I thought, okay, we're, we're doing projects with low-income communities and also, you know, with entrepreneurship and how to get going. But what we realized is that there's even, like, extremely low income where simple things like insurance, you know, was very difficult um, to do. So what I think we were able to accomplish is to try to, uh, what I call it, uh, create the lowest first rung and then try to design, you know, programs and various initiatives that then led from one rung to the next. So I was thinking about uh, there was a focus on food we thought, oh, yeah, no, everybody knows about food. Everyone has some sort of relationship with food. You know, we have these entrepreneurs who are cooks and they want to be in the food business. But if New York is similar to San Francisco, um, it's a lot of money just to open a storefront. You know, you're automatically looking at a million dollars. So forget about moderate income people, definitely not low income, and extremely low income, no. So how do we begin to get people started. So one of the initiatives was just getting a food handler's license, which was the basic, that can you work in a kitchen and, you know, legally. And then from there, could you then, um, we had some strategies for mobile food vending, so that way maybe you could, you know, sell your sandwiches or food on the, you know, in a cart and then move up to maybe a vehicle, to then maybe a storefront after that. But the whole idea is to be able to create the sequence that's uninterrupted that will let people climb because there's an emotional component to it. Um, failure, folks, you really want to avoid that, but then not let people feel that they're afraid to fail. So it's a tricky balance. Um, but we were able to uh, get folks started in the food business and um, I would say one barrier you had was the system itself. Like the New York City Housing Authority was a barrier to success in their yeah. bureaucracy. Yeah, that is something. 27,000 employees. You know, I was there for a six-month assignment. I thought, okay, great. You know, let's get a uh, general counsel. I met with the general counsel. I said, we, we need to get an outside counsel. He's like, I totally agree with you, Kyle. I'm like, okay, so what is it going to take? And he's like, okay, yeah, I think we could probably get someone by about late October. It was like May, April when I was there. And I'm like, it's going to take five months to hire an outside counsel. When we got a pro bono counsel, you know, for free in November, I was thinking, wow, government is, in fact, an obstacle. It took five months just to hire an attorney that didn't even charge us. So... With your work of uh, prototyping and doing the pop-up shops and the buses, what's some of the experiences that you've had with the prototyping, the fabrication process itself? And like, what advice do you have to the students with, of like working with fabricators and the design challenges of the fabrication? Yeah. Uh, so 
The first one challenge that we had was actually just finding fabricators who could trick out a bus. It took me a year to find someone who could do it. Um, you know, we do have this interesting community here called the Burning Man community. Um, I just went to Burning Man. It's awesome. Uh, and uh, they, we found some folks to do it. Um, they, some of them fell through, so it was a real process. Uh, and then when we, f we finally found some really good fabricators, um, and we were very fortunate that they were fabricator artists, right? So there was a little bit of an extra, and one way we work with them, which I highly recommend, is just let them design with you and let them create things. We just gave them chunks of the project, like a piece like, well, you just work that out. You know, work that piece out. Um, and we gave them a loose set of drawings, like, so it wasn't super detailed. Julia helped make some of those, so you're familiar. And, uh, you know, we're on site a lot with them, so we picked fabricators who were nearby at American Steel, and so we were able to go over there, and then we also had, a, it was a range of fabricators, so we had uh, the, the folks who were welding, we had the sort of the wood, our, our carpenters nearby who were laser cutting, um, there was the electrician was there, like, so everybody was like under one roof, these sort of small shop of folks working together. Uh, we had good people leading the job, that was also a big deal. And we spent a lot of time together figuring things out on site. Like, hey, this isn't going to work. I'm like, okay, well, let's do this. Um, and we love working with them. And we're now doing the next set of prototypes with them as well. And we involved them even earlier. Like, just come in early. And we invite them to the workshops. They came to some of the workshops that we did. We, sh we make sure they know the people that we're doing this for so that they understand the mission and they understand what we're trying to do. And they're really part of the team. And they meet you know, folks, and we always just include them. They're part of the design team. They're not, you know, the fabricators. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being the fabricators. I wish I was a fabricator, but uh, people forget about them. And there's the reason that bus looks really good is because of them. It's all because of them, uh, the love and attention they put into it, so. Any other questions from, from this? From this group, um, I, I guess I want to add a couple comments. One along that line is one of my favorite um, images from a talk I saw Deanna give was your uh, in your studio printing the material, the upholstery material that the uh, women had designed in workshop, and you had essentially taken it and fabricated it yourself. And to me, that was uh, representative of how we use our skills all the way from community organization all the way down to printmaking and fabric and it was uh, left, I will never forget that, um, that image. Um, I guess I have a question with regard, we have students here who have been uh, working in community uh, engagement, um, had successes and, and hit obstacles. And one of the things that I've heard um, is that there are more groups that are trying to gain uh, community feedback, and they're starting to pay community uh, members to, to give that feedback. And I'm just curious if you have experience with that, what the pros and cons are, and just maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah. We're just talking about that today. I was like, we, we shouldn't pay. You know, if they want us there, they'll participate. But, and then there's a big but to that, which is resources, uh, among other things, or the lack thereof, and um, maybe even saturation to a certain extent. There is, a, in some communities, there's a, a lot of folks who are trying to interact. Sure, they have good intentions, but in particular, the Bayview is it's got a lot of people who've come through there with various ideas of how to help the community. And, you know, some have, some have helped and others have not. Um, but there's definitely an air of skepticism uh, when engaging with that community. And I'm sure there's others. I overall believe you should pay people. Mm -hmm. I think you should give them something for their expertise. You know, I, I, I think it should be like, you know, jury duty, right? Everybody has community engagement time and you pay them to come. It should be part of our government, you know, it's just people, it's just something you just get paid to do. Um, 
but it is tricky in terms of how much and people's expectations and um, the way in which you, you provide the compensation. Uh, we're trying all different kinds of things. We hear different things from the mayor's office, like, well, I don't just like to give money. Really, you should do it this way. And then, you know, like one thing we might pay is like, oh, you get credit at the village and you can buy things. Or like, how do you do it in a way that's respectful and helpful? Um, I feel like we're trying to figure that out. Yeah, and, yeah we're trying to figure it out. Keep us in the loop. Yeah, we'll let you know what we learn. All the funders are like, what are you learning? I'm like, a lot of stuff. <laughs> we haven't figured it out, though. We learned a bunch of stuff. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any other any questions? Because I have more. <laughs> <laughs> Which were their questions, right? So Not all. <laughs> oh, these are yours. The BB ones. I slip in a few. Oh, okay. Just to mix it up. Okay. No, I do have one that I would like to ask, and, and maybe this kind of um, helps bring it to, in a circle, bring it around. Um, what would you like our students to know about your journey and how they might find a voice through their designs or, and or actions? one of the expressions that you have, which is to be open to abundance, you know? Uh, you know, in coming out to California, I was in New York, and Deanna uh, asked me, hey, you know, can you help me out on this thing? I was, yeah, sure, I'll come out. This sounds great. And uh, in many ways, the, the journey that we've, we've traveled has been very kinetic, and... Um, and really just with an open heart and open mind to just kind of go with with our passions and to listen and just be engaged really so i'm not sure if that's anything so uh prescriptive to say do this or to, to or to do that but you know really just be open to life's abundance and and go for it really lean into it i have something specific that I will add. Um, you know, I think you have to know yourself, like really know yourself. Understand your life story. What is your story of you, you know, that, that got you here? Uh, so that you know really what you care about and what your motives are. Um, you know, I think for me, a lot of the, the reason that I'm really passionate about this work is I did a lot of work on myself to, to wake up, to be more conscious, to understand and see uh, where uh, my wounds were and where my prejudices were and where my biases were and where I was not forgiving people and where I was not participating and, my, and where my actions and words were not aligned with my, my values. So I think doing that inner work is really, really critical to uh, both having the courage to do the things that you need to do and to do them with an authenticity so that you do no harm. Right, so proceed in the world doing no harm, but you're going to do harm if you don't do your own inner work. So I always say that. I really believe that's important. Whatever that looks like for you, uh, please do it. Uh, we need more people to act consciously in the world from that place. Couldn't agree more. It's the, in some ways kind of the first step to writing one's own mission. You know, as a company, we have missions, and sure. but as people, what's your what's your personal mission before you then step out and uh, you know really apply that? Uh, because as you said, you know, you're going to come at it then with a lot more authenticity and yeah, It'll be a lot more successful. I mean, yeah. DJDS is going pretty good primarily because of that root work that mm -hmm. Kyle and I did on ourselves, and our intention is super clean. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get stuff, we're like, that's okay. Something else will come along, and something always does. <laughs> that abundance. <laughs> yeah, the abundance comes. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Um, I want to recommend to everyone, if you haven't been on their website, to please go on their website. Um, it's hard to come back off. I went in and did a deep dive. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, it's the bane of our existence, the no, website thing. No, like, it's, it's really not. There's a huge, huge amount of incredibly useful and insightful and inspiring information, um, and the toolkits, and the engagement, community engagement, and all of that. So 
if you go there, spend some time because it's really, really um, inspiring. It really is. I do community engagement. I mean, in my own way. And it's, I can't agree with you more. It's so not easy. <laughs> But when I went on and I saw, look at all these fabulous things. I'm, gonna, I'm doing that next time. I got that game thing going now. And, you know, so there's just a lot, to re a lot to learn if you're interested in participation, right, which I think a lot of us are here. So um, please go check out their website. Um, and also please join me in thanking them for spending their evening with us. Um, really wonderful to have you. And we're going to look forward to more news uh, post-occupancy information, <laughs> and all sorts of good things. Thank you both. Thank you, sure. Thank you so much. Really Thank you, guys. Thank you for spending all this time with us. Listen to us and run our mouths. <laughs>